Hey, uh, so I'm Mark Thomas. I'm an engineer here at Cohistory. Uh, I joined here like one and a half years ago. Before that, I was at Google. I worked in the search infrastructure team. I worked there for about five years, and I'm very excited to work here in Cohistory in the infrastructure portion of our company. So what I'm going to talk about today is the Cohistory architecture and one of the key underlying technologies that underpin it, which is the snap tree. And as part of that, I'm going to talk about a couple of additional workflows that we enable using this architecture and snap tree technology that we have. I'm going to talk about integrated backups, and I'm going to talk about DevOps workflows. Before we get into the integrated backups, uh, sorry, before we get into the Cohistory architecture, I'd like to talk about what the IT landscape looks like today in an enterprise setting. So let's say we have a VMware environment over there, and we want to protect it. We want to back up all the production images over there and back it up in some safe place. So traditionally, you deploy a master server that runs your backup software. The master server requires additional pieces of uh, software that runs on media servers that actually pull the data from your VMware environment. And they pull it, and then they write it onto backup targets that reside elsewhere. Now, as you can see, this picture is a little complicated already. You have three different pieces over here on top of your production environment just to back it up. And as you scale, as you increase the capacity and your size of your production infrastructure, you have to increase the size of your backup infrastructure so that it can scale linearly as well. And for that, you have to add more media servers and you have to add more backup targets over there. Well, this is just for VMware. What if you want to also back up something else? What if you have application servers and databases lying around as well? Then you add more media servers and more backup targets on the back end to back them up. And as you can see, now we're already introducing more pieces in the back end over there. Instead of having just one backup target, we now have two backup targets. And why is that? That's because typically these systems cannot uh, grow beyond a certain capacity. And so once they hit a certain capacity, you have to add more, more backup targets over there. And the application servers write to new targets. And so your data ends up going in multiple places. We can add more production environments over here. Let's say we added Hyper-V. Then you have yet another set of media servers over there that are talking to another set of backup targets over there. So as you can see, this is already getting cluttered. We have a lot of systems over here. They are creating too many servers. Each of these servers typically install their own agents uh, in your production environment. So you have too many agents floating around. Uh, because of the way they are architected, they usually result in you know giving you low recovery point objectives and low uh, recovery time objectives. They do not scale very well. They are not designed to be distributed. So uh, they have slow ingest performance. And another thing to note is that like, because of the media servers over there, they end up copying data from production to your media servers and then to your tar target storage. So there's like additional copies of data flowing around in your system. Uh, one very important thing to mention here is that even though your backup servers are backing up everything in your production, who is backing up your backup servers? So if your backup servers ever go down, who is backing up your catalog? Who is backing up your index? Right? Nobody is doing that. So that is a big problem over here. Then on the backup target side, you know, as, as I mentioned before, each of these backup targets are like silos of data because each application is talking to one or more, one or two specific targets, and each of them are like you know pointing to different things. And so you end up with data living in different uh, capsules of data, uh, capsules of storage that not, that are not aware of each other. So this leads to a problem of where you know there's no global view of data, and that basically means that you cannot do global dedupe. So you have dedupe that is ineffective and fragmented. So this is just, by the way, backups. What if you want to do something else? What if you want to actually uh, run, some, run some additional workflows? Let's say you want to run an experiment, or you want to introduce a new feature, right? And you want to test the new feature out. You want to basically spin out new copies, spin out copies of your data from production, and then mount it onto someplace else, and then run your application servers on top of that. We call this the DevOps workflow. And to do that, as you see, we have to basically take copies of data, write it onto some new place, and then bring up more servers to use that data. Uh, this picture, as you can see, is, is getting really messy. There's too many systems over here. There's too many uh, licenses of these systems to handle. There's too many UIs to manage. Uh, there's many copies of data being like stored everywhere. 
and the data ends up being like you know accumulating in a lot of different places and you have no control over it so this is kind of a mess and what we want to do is fix this mess so one thing that you said is the catalog's not backed up yeah i've worked in many places catalog is almost always replicated somewhere else but I, the, the cattle you know if we're talking about it's not a backup simpana or net backup or tsm or networker anything with this architecture then the media servers have no data so i'm not creating additional right. copies in the media server they're just data movers the master server has the database and it copies itself and it backs itself up yeah, you're, you're overstating the problems here yeah. substantially compared to our 50 or 100 years of collected experience at the table. And if I wanted copies of my VMs, I'd just clone them, not restore from backup. You know, not to mention that having copies for test and dev is not DevOps, that's having copies for test and dev. DevOps means something else. Well, uh, I mean, typically, I mean, yeah, you can definitely, like, you know, replicate your catalog and your database but not even replicate my catalog the master server runs windows or linux mm -hmm. and the master server can back itself up to the same tape library that it backs everything else up or to the same disk library that it backs everything else so up to. howard that's a good point the the point behind this is to point out that are just too many too many moving parts i i understand uh, right. but your your point is lost by overstating if yeah. you say that the world really sucks and the world is just slightly difficult, then you've lost credibility. Well, okay. In some cases, um, you may have vendors that have some optimizations. Uh, maybe the uh, the catalog is not backed up, or maybe in some cases you have you mentioned net backup. The media Does anyone on maybe staff know I'm what sorry? a catalog is for backup software? I'm sorry. How many people in this company have actually ran as a backup administrator? Well, we don't have backup administrators here, but we've tested that stuff. Uh, but let's let's so go. So you're, you're let's saying you're a company it. with no one who's ever done the job of the software you're trying to well, build. Well, we deal with a lot of people that do that. But I think let's move on because the point here is there are too many moving parts. Let's uh, you, go you, beyond. You have a valid point uh -huh. that is lost by vast overstatement. Well, yeah. I we take that point. It's a point taken. Um, let's move on. And regarding your DevOps point, I think uh, we just use that change interchange. Uh, we you use that technology a little again, bit interchangeably. Again, <coughs> you're using terms that have meanings with different definitions than everyone else, which just leads to confusion. You're, you're right. The Wikipedia definition of DevOps tends to be a little bit different from Test and Dev, but Test and Dev doesn't quite capture, um, you know, what we want to do here. It's, it's Test and Dev plus maybe file shares, maybe a few more things. So we just but, use but the term. But if you're using DevOps, that is implying Puppet, Chef, Ansible. Yes. Let's just say, OK, we don't have a better term for capturing stuff more then, than then test and dev. Then invent one. Uh, we, before we invent that term, I apologize. We're going to use DevOps in this presentation. So bear with us. Go for it. Yeah. Um, the other thing I want to mention is that regarding clones, I mean, uh, the way we do clones for DevOps is very efficient, unlike what you can do in typical, typically in VMware and stuff. So, that's that's when we do clones our DevOps, the resulting uh, environment that we get for DevOps is much more efficient and less costlier to uh, manage. So that's why you highlighted that over there. Sorry. So we want to simplify this architecture. So how do we do that? Well, Cohesity. Uh, is a platform that exposes standard protocols like NFS and SIFS, like Johnny mentioned. So we can basically uh, become your target service, backup target service, and replace your servers over there. So that that thing goes away, and you just have a box over there that acts as your target server. Your media servers and your application servers, what have you not, can directly point to them, uh, di directly point to the Cohesity platform and dump your data onto us. Now, you start with a one-node cluster, which is around sorry, a four-node cluster, which is around 96 terabytes. If you ever grow out of that capacity, you can just add more nodes. The system linearly scales. Uh, it, it handles the new nodes transparently, and there is no limit on how much it can scale. So you basically have a clustered system that has a global view of all the data, and there is no separate silos of data anymore. So we have kind of fixed that part of the problem over here, where data is just like in multiple different systems. The second thing is that we can do something even better than this. Because our system comes with integrated backup software built inside, 
we don't need any of the components over here on the left hand side to do a backup for us. We don't need meter servers, we don't need master servers, we can just have all our production infrastructure directly talk to a QoHT platform because we know how to do backups for you. And last but not the least, uh, we have DevOps running on the side over there, but the question is why do we need DevOps? Why do we need to spin off additional copies to bring up DevOps environments? Uh, the answer is that you don't because we have the ability to spin off clones of your data and use those clones to run your DevOps workflows. So you don't need anything on the right over there. So you get rid of that and we just directly talk to us. So in just backups and DevOps, we have given you a much more simplified architecture over here. But this is not where it stops. We also, we also allow you to uh, easily recover things in the unfortunate case if something goes wrong. So in, if you ever have to recover a VM or if you ever have to recover a file, you know, it's important that you be able to do it in immediately and without any delays. And so we use our technology to instantly recover your VMs, your files, your objects back to your production infrastructure instantly. So we do all of this with one single platform and that is a simplification we are doing. So you might ask, like, how do we do this? Well, we have a special sauce, you know, uh, that really enables us to build all this. This it basically is the cloning technology inside a distributed file system. The clones that we do uh, has many special properties. Some of them are that we can take we can take clones instantly. That means it takes less than a second to take a clone of any piece of data. It happens in a completely distributed manner. So even if you clone on one node the clone is visible on any other node in the system immediately. And one of the most important things about this cloning is that you can take these clones very frequently. There is no limit on how many clones you can take. So this means that uh, you can go to any point in time and choose any clone over there and recover that. And so it allows you to get a low RPO. But the added value in all of this is that on top hold, of hold, this... Hold on a second. Yeah. I understand you're, you're making clones in the storage system. <coughs> but if you're saying that the cloning is giving me a low RTO, low low RPO, a low RPO, because I'm making frequent clones, that's only true if the latest copy of the data is already in your system. If I'm running a SQL Server on primary storage, you making clones on the left hand doesn't protect. I mean, you got to move the data. Yes, yes. So we we a system basically allows you to take snapshots from your primary environment and keep keep it on us as frequently as you want. So if if your primary environment can support it, we can keep writing you know additional deltas <coughs> on top of a previous copies. So we can keep writing uh, additional okay, snapshots. We're, we're talking past each other a little. Uh, okay. Are you doing snapshots at the storage level or the hypervisor? We're we talking about building the problem from pri from primary into the secondary storage. Talking at the cohesity level. We're talking about we're, over here. Just we're talking about level. clones at the cohesity platform level. How do you get okay. them from primary storage? Yeah. So in, in let's say let's take VMware for example. So in VMware, you basically connect to VMware. We connect to the ESX host and ask it to take a snapshot of the VM, right? And we then uh, that that's VMware snapshot, and we pull that snapshot onto our system. That's what I was asking. Yeah. So you're doing it at the Hypervisor level. Yes. So with hypervisor there, is, there, is two, there are two different kinds of snapshots. One is yeah. a snapshot at the production environment, and then you have to also take that snapshot and write it into our system, right? Okay. So we write it into a snapshot into our system. Right. That's but what we are talking about so over here. But, 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 the, but, my, but, my R, but my RPO isn't easy. determined by your snapshots, it's determined by the yeah. source snapshots. You, you are correct, but it's, it's, okay. you need both, right? I mean, I, I understand. Yeah. So, all right. So, I mean, let's let's take a, a full step back, because okay. you're talking about what you do with data once you have the data, and you haven't talked to us about how you get the data or wh what the data is there. So, you're talking about that you know you're baking, and you've given us, in, and you say, and the ingredients are all here, but where do we get the ingredient? You know, the the story doesn't make sense in the order you're telling it. That okay. so so you know for VMware you're going to do a vStorage API for data protection backup. Correct. All right. So now that means that if I'm running SQL Server or Exchange, that you we have VSS provider problems because VMware tools won't do log truncation. 
So have, are you provide? You know, let let's let you know, you're. We're talking about backups, and the m first part of backups is the source, not the destination. I also think our that probably they also store a lot of data like uh, for analytics for example if they emulate HDFS or whatever they so, use so how yeah, so but they but can but run have, uh, right, but, they can but run workloads my, my, my on point, top of it my so point they can is get <coughs> clones my point is we don't know already stored in, we don't in we don't know what that data is yet and we're already talking about how so the how let me let me take that so first of all i think um, we have adapters in our system that are uh, primary storage specific, so we have an adapter that can pull stuff from VMware. Similarly, for databases, we'll have an adapter for that. But the well, point that do. just just one sec, uh, point that Mark is trying to make is if we only had the ability to take infrequent snapshots, then even when we pull that data, where are the, we going to store it? We'll have to store it as incremental on the side, which will you know, lengthen the time that it'll take to recover from that. The point is we can take frequent snapshots in our system, pull the data, assuming we can pull it frequently. If we cannot pull it frequently, then yes, Howard, you're right, our RPO is not that great. But if we, assuming we can pull it frequently, then we can write that on this snapshot that we can take frequently, and then uh, we but get my, all those my, nice my properties. Prob my problem's not with what your capabilities are. Yeah. My problem is you're, you're talking about capabilities that are dependent on other things you haven't talked about yet. And I, I don't understand, you know, and, and if the data, the music goes whoa, 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 and you guys started with comes out here. I think what you're saying is that you have a necessary condition, not a sufficient condition. Is that what you're saying? I'm, I'm, I'm saying that you're talking about the details of how you work with data, but you haven't described the data sufficiently for me to understand whether the details are important or not. Um, I guess I still don't get it, but let's imagine a VMware environment. Um, I'm, I'm going to give you a VMware environment because VMware environments are the simplest case because vStorage API for data protection yes. makes life really simple. Correct. So, but, you know, but if you're saying you're going to replace NetBackup or Simpana, then you have to support a much broader set of sources and we need to know how you, you know, you're saying you're going to be the data mover, not just the storage, but you're talking about back-end features and I haven't got the data into the system yet. That's right. So let, let me answer it this way. For systems like VMware, I think you already understand. We have our software, we have our adapters, but remember, we also expose our storage layer through industry standard protocols so we can always use a third-party software some of the ones that you mentioned to target and put stuff on us. Uh, so that's that might be one way. But uh, our current system focuses on VMware environments. So that definitely can provide a good RPO. And this whole conversation would have gone a whole lot smoother had we if mentioned you said that, that an hour ago. Well, there you go. go ahead. Yeah. So right now we support VMware and we're working on supporting SQL too. So we, we are working on like supporting multiple different ways to get your data into a system. But as Mohit mentioned, one key element of allowing you to get a low RPO is also that we need to be able to create clones frequently and you know have no limits on that. Now, on top of the clone set, on, on, in addition to these features that are listed for the clones, the other important thing about a clones is that our clones are completely writable and modifiable. We use a redirect on write technology for that, so that means that uh, if some if somebody wants to modify a piece of data in that clone, we just write a new piece of data and update all the pointers that were pointing to the old piece of data and have it just point to the new piece of data. So in this case, there is no copies that are going on. We don't use a copy and write scheme. So it's very efficient. And the other thing is that we keep our clones fully hydrated. And by that I mean that when we do incremental backups, we typically get deltas, right? We take the deltas and we don't store it as separate deltas, but instead we do a sort of merging of the deltas with the base snapshot so that we get a full image. And this merging is very quick and does not take any extra resources on our side. So it's a very low cost and very highly useful thing that we have in our clones. To summarize, the two key things that we have over here, and uh, the two key things that that our clones provide is basically the frequent snapshotting and full hydration allows us to get in one system uh, a low RPO and a low RTO, which does not really exist in many other systems. And this is what enables us to do a lot of other things. In the next few slides, I'll talk about how we achieve this. But first, let's talk about how uh, traditionally systems have been doing cloning so far. So in this case, let's imagine you have a file over there, version one. 
and you have pieces of data in there. Let's let's say that there are three blocks of data, A, B, and C, and you want to create a clone of this file. So you go ahead and create a clone, and that becomes version two of the file, and it points to the original version. Now, if you want to write, uh, let's say you want to update A and B, you go and update A and B, and you write those updated versions in file version two, but C still remains in file version one. Now, let's say we go ahead and create another clone. This is file version three. In file version three, we write A, so A becomes, you know, the third version of the of A uh, stays over there. Now, in this case, we have a chain of links over here that basically create our clones. If you want to read something, let's say you want to read a data block called C, you start by reading file version three because it's the latest, but you find that file version three does not have the data block, so you go to file version two and then you go to file version 1 because file version 2 did not have it and only file version 1 has it. So basically to satisfy your read request you have to traverse the entire chain and this can get problematic because as your chain grows, as you create more snapshots, your chain keeps growing and so your read and write requests potentially are like delayed by that much amount of time. Now traditionally vendors, you know, to solve this problem, they, what they do is they start breaking the chain. They start breaking the chain after it gets around, you know, like a couple of hundred blocks or something. And when they break the chain, they start collapsing all the different clones together. Uh, and that process simply is, you know, you just basically start merging the versions, the versions from the right. So version two and version three are merged to get a version three, and version three and version one are merged to get a version one. So you have a final version of the file, which is basically a collapsed version of the file, and it has all the latest versions of all your data blocks. Now, the problem with this is that this entire collapsing and merging business is resource intensive because you have to copy all your data, you have to copy all your metadata. So it's, it's, it's time consuming, resource intensive. So basically, when you do clones in a traditional system, there are limits at a place that dictate how frequently and how instantaneously you can take clones. And we want to avoid this problem. So here, I'm going to talk about how we make a special sauce. Uh, what we do is basically we we have this concept of a snap tree. A snap tree, you can think of it as a distributed data structure that lives on all our nodes that can be used to represent a file or a file system. In this case, let's say the snap tree represents a file at version one. It has these three data blocks, A, B, and C. They are the leaf nodes of the tree. If you want to read, let's say, data block B, you start from the root of the tree. This is R1. You start from the root of the tree and find out that to reach to B, you have to go to this node P1 and then you reach P. So you have to go through two hops to reach P. So that's basically how a snap tree can be used to represent a file. So is there any questions till this point? Does every node in a cluster have to have the full no. tree structure? No. So, copy of? so this entire tree is represented in a distributed fashion. So then data is like spread across the entire system. So each node uh, can build this. If they want, the, the node can actually figure out what the tree looks like. But the, the entire uh, the it contents of the snap. It's tree logically available on every node. Mm -hmm. Physically not. Physically only the cache stuff is available. Yeah. So now that we know how a snap tree looks like, let's go ahead and create a clone of the snap tree. So we create a new snap tree, which represents file version two. We start off with an empty root node, R two. And what you could have done at this point is basically have R2 point to R1 over here. So this is looking exactly like, or not exactly, but similar to what I showed you in the previous slide. So we just have the file version 2 directly linked to file version 1. Uh, in this case, you if, you are, if you are looking closely, you might have noticed that now to reach the, the data block B from file version 2, I have to traverse three different nodes to get here. So I have to go from R2 to R1, then to P1, and then to B. So the number of hops that I had to traverse has increased from two to three. As you keep adding more clones, you will keep doing the same thing. And the number of hops that you need to access the leaf node will keep increasing linearly. And this will lead us back to the same problem that I described earlier, which you don't want to do. So instead of doing this, we do something else. What we do is we just point to the children of the the previous root node. So in this case, these two are the children. So we just have the new root node point to the, the children of that root node. And as you can see now, R2, if it wants to reach B, it just has to traverse two hops. 
essentially the point I'm trying to make is that the number of hops that are required to reach a leaf node doesn't change. Even if you add more clones, if you add more clones, file version 3, 4, 5, they always end up pointing to the children of your previous root node. So the number of hops that are required to go from the root to the child remain constant. So this is basically how we are able to do clones that are instantaneous and frequent because our clones never accumulate long chains. They never have to be consolidated and stuff like that. So any questions up to this point? What's the maximum amount of clones on the system? We don't have any limits on the number of clones. You can keep creating clones as many as you like because it's just a matter of adding pointers to your children over here and the number of hops never increases. All right. Uh, can so I consolidate clones? Because I want, you know, I want to do daily backups and keep every day for a week, and then I want to consolidate that down into monthlies. And so I want to keep all the changes, but I don't need the granularity. Oh, so all you do to do that is just delete the ones that you don't need, and the the, the self healing process would. Uh, that's not itself. the same thing. If I if I made a backup on Tuesday, and then I made that that has the data that changed on Tuesday. Then I made a backup on Wednesday, and it has the data that changed on Wednesday. What I want to do is create a new clone that has the pointers to all of to, to the net result of all of these yeah, changes. Yeah, so he's, he's going to say, uh, he's going to talk about some changes. Why don't you finish that? Yeah, let, I let want to expire data eventually. Yeah, no, I, I think I, is I, I, as my retention schedule right. extends out into time, I want reducing granularity, but I still want to have a valid restore yeah. points. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. But retention would be extremely important when you're talking about backups. Right, right. But, from but compliance you know, my right. year-old data, I'm perfectly right. fine with saying, you know, I only need one image a week that I can restore from. Mm. All right, so let me just explain some more things over here. So this is just the cloning aspect of it, but what if you want to actually modify some data? Let's say you want to update file version 2 to have some new pieces of data. Let's say you want to update data blocks A and B. So what we do simply is write new data blocks for A and B over there. And what we need to only do over here is change R2 so that it points to A and B. And that is simply achieved by adding a new intermediate node there and have it point to A and B. And we also have to update some links on R2 so that it doesn't point to the old version of A. So the previous slide, it was pointing, this, this, <coughs> this link over here was pointing to the old version of A. But when we create a new version of A, we have R2 change that link, remove that, and add a new link that points to the new version of A. So in this case, R2 is now pointing to the new versions of A and B that resides in file version 2, but it continues to point to the old version of C that resides in file version 1. And if you want to create another clone over here, we do something similar, exactly the same. We create an empty node, have it point to the children of the previous node. So R3 will point to the children of R2, which in this case is P3 and P2. So this is a clone of file version 2. If you want to like modify something over there in file version 3, we basically modify A, let's say. And at this point, we just need to update R3 to point to the new version of A and not point to the old version of A. So if you do that by just updating some pointers, as you can see. So this was the old pointer, and this is the new pointers. So in this way, R3 is pointing to the new version of A, but to the previous versions of B and C. So how to your uh, question, now if you want to not keep file version 2, you can just delete that. And uh, whatever nodes get off and will be garbage collected. OK. Any other questions on this part? So each node talks, it calls pointers to two other nodes beneath them? Or two is, is the minimum. I mean, like you can have not, not the minimum, but you can have theoretically uh, many, many pointers. It's a, within a so there's within a fan a out. You can yeah. have a fan out. It ranges from 8 to 16, kind of like in a B plus tree. Um, so it's not limited to two. Yeah, two is just shown here for illustration purposes, but typically on a file system, you'll have eight plus children or something because you want to achieve a low height in the tree. So, so this is how clones work in snap trees. Uh, but what exactly is a snap tree? A snap tree, like I said, is a distributed data structure that can be used to represent many things. One thing that can be used to represent is the entire file system itself. In this case, I've shown a picture of a file system as a snap tree, where the leaf node in the file system represents objects like files or directories, right? And, and then on top of this, this is concept is so general that we can extend it to say that the files themselves are represented as snap trees. So each file 
points to another snap tree which represents the contents of that particular file. So snap tree, file one snap tree has the contents of file one. And what we have in our, in our system is basically that in this snap tree, all the leaf nodes of the file snap tree actually contain the data chunks of the file. And from a distributed perspective, you're, you're taking some portion of this tree and distributing it across all the nodes. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Okay, so that basically covers the, uh, the architecture part with Cohesity and how we use snap trees. Now, I'm going to talk about two workflows that we enable using all these technologies that I mentioned. The first is our integrated backup solution. As I mentioned, our, a platform can be used to replace your backup workflows and your backup systems that you have today because we come with integrated backup. Uh, our, policies are, our, our, policies are easy, our policies are easy to set up. Uh, you can protect your entire environment, whether it be the vCenter or a data center or clusters within your vCenter. You can all be protected with single click, easy to define policies. We index all your data as soon as they are backed up. So you can you know search by search by the vm's name or files within a vm and you can use search search using in like a google like search interface you know once it's backed up all objects are available for being recovered instantly back to the original destination or if it's a file you can even download it to your uh, machine if you want to so just on that instant recovery piece so again going back kind of the talk about the primary and secondary and where the primary data is sitting um, can you just talk about how that would happen if, you know, say you've got a vSphere environment running on primary storage? Mm -hmm. Is it possible to instant clone to, uh, sorry, instant recover to that? Or are you doing something like providing a recovery data store that you can instantly spin up a VM on and then maybe storage vMotion the machine yeah, later? Yeah, so we, what we do is basically the second thing. We bring up a, a cloned view of a cloned data of your backup snapshot. We bring up a VM using that register to vCenter and it's initially running off uh, our data store, yeah. right? But it's powered on and it's immediately usable. Yeah. And in the background, we just storage motion it to your primary cluster. Cool. So are you getting file level information about what you're backing up or just VMDK? No, we're getting file level. So we basically understand what's inside your VMs. And we allow you to search that using, you know, as you type, when you, when, if you want to search as you type, we'll show you all the results available, uh, similar to exactly what you'd like to see in Google. And like I mentioned before, a so backup, sorry. At, so you're indexing the internal file system? Via? Yeah, you're, you're getting your data from vStorage API data protection, which is delivering you a VMDK. Mm -hmm. Now, so, and then you're indexing that file system, or are you full text indexing so I can use it for archive too? So we basically index, we understand what's inside the VMDK. And so we index all of the files, uh, at least all the metadata about all the files inside the VMDK. We okay. don't right now index the file contents because that would take a lot of space. We don't do that, <coughs> but it's something that we can do. It just we don't do it because. Okay, so so the the spec for the vStorage API for data protection says you have to be able to do that for NTFS. Do you do that for Linux file systems as well? Yes. We do it for Linux file systems as well. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so like I said, uh, backups can be done continuously because of the way we do frequent clones and snapshots that allows us to get a low RPO. We can keep our backups fully hyd hydrated, so it allows us to get a low RPO. On top of that, you know, I mentioned like in the first slide that systems in the traditional systems require additional workflows to back up your catalog. In our system, you don't need that at all because the entire backup metadata and catalog is resides in our uh, distributed file system, which is already protected against failures. Uh, we work with multiple environments like VMware, SQL, etc. Uh, we are a distributed system that can ingest at you know using all the power of all our nodes. But at the same time, even though we provide high throughput, we monitor your your primary environment and see whether your primary is having problems. If we detect that your primary is having problems, we adaptively throttle ourselves back so that we don't put any load over there. And last but not least, even though I've only been talking about backups over here, uh, what we really offer is data protection. So we basically allow you to protect your entire data by not just taking backups, but also by shipping that data out to uh, tape or cloud if you want to, or even replicating it, replicating it to another Cohesity cluster. So we offer the entire suit over here. And the final thing that- Going back to your tape, yeah. uh, how are you pulling that off? How we, so what we're doing is that we have 
uh, partnerships with other vendors that know how to talk to uh, tape and we tell them so basically they know how the, the interface to connect to tape libraries right and so we basically interface with them to basically uh, copy our data out to tape is that your question all right so the tapes not zoned to these or any of that the tape is not directly zoned to the cohesity cluster it will be tape uh, zoned to the with the tape service that we use with with the, with the with the external service that we interface with so so you're exporting to a crossroad strong box or a spectra black pearl that gives you a standard api to write to the tape i believe we uh, yeah so we we use something standard like that uh uh with qstar yeah so we use qstar right now okay QSTAR basically interfaces with a lot of different tape libraries. It gives you a NAS front end yeah. to a tape yeah. library. Okay, so does that mean that I could export to arbitrary NAS as well? Uh, sorry, what? You does can. that mean I could export to arbitrary yeah. NAS as well? That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and then what format do I see that data in? Just a li the, the VMDKs? So if you store a full image, then it'll be your VMDKs, yes. But if you start doing deltas, then you'll see delta VMDKs, right? Depends. Which, w which would mean I'd need you to reconsolidate yeah. them all right. back together. Right. Uh, is is there a cloud implementation of the software so that when my data center burns down, yeah. I can... Yeah, yeah, the recovery can be done using software. Yeah, and f the final workflow that we really enable is basically running DevOps. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, we can create instant clones and that allows you to bring up entire environments instantly. We have a shopping, li shopping cart like UI in our interface, something similar to what you see in Amazon. So you can just basically <coughs> pick objects like individual VMs, add them to your basket. If you don't like them later, you can remove them. Once you're happy with your whatever's in your basket, you can just say click. You can just click on it and it instantly orchestrate everything and bring up your VMs on your production environment, ready for use. Once you're done using them, you can just click another button and all of them will be toned down and you're back to where you started. Uh, because uh, DevOps applications tend to do a lot of random I.O., uh, they, they, they need to be optimized. The performance of our system needs to be optimized for that. So we basically do dynamic I.O. tiering to ensure that hot data stays on SSD and colder data moves out of SSD, like to hard disk or to cloud. Uh, and like I mentioned, we use redirect on write technology. So it allows us to write to our clones and modify them at a very cheap price and keep it very efficient. Since we're talking about DevOps, can I take my own clones on demand with Puppet or some type of orchestration layer, or am I I'm having to use your interface to schedule? N them? No, you can take clones using Puppet too, uh, but we also provide the ability to do it via, we do the orchestration for you if you want us to do it, so we make it easier for you. And and you provide a REST API for me to use Chef for Yes. Principle. Yes. 